Well, morning. Uh, we welcome you to our uh, Sunday service. Um, it's going out at 11 o'clock on YouTube. Though you could be watching it at 11 o'clock on a Sunday or whatever time you wanted during the week. Um, whenever it is, you're more than welcome to spend the next few moments with us. Uh, just so you know what's going to happen, um, we're going to uh, read from God's Word and we're going to pray together and then uh, we'll have a, a sermon which is when um, we'll, uh, I'll take you through the, the particular passage in a bit more detail and, and uh, see what it has to say to us. Um, so we're, we hope you can spend uh, this time with us. Um, uh, we're from Bethel Baptist in Thlai and uh, we'd love to see you when uh, lockdown is finished and when the church is open again. But in the meantime, you're, you're more than welcome to, to visit us in this virtual world. Uh, uh, so let me read from God's word uh, and then we'll pray together. <clears throat> so we're, we're looking uh, through a, a series in the, in the Old Testament book of Joshua and uh, we've been uh, looking at all the marvellous, exciting things that, that God has been doing um, with his people, uh, the Israelites. And uh, this morning we come to chapter 4. And I'm going to read the first 14 verses of chapter 4. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you will lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, when your children ask in time to come, what do those stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off from before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. And the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded and took up twelve stones out of the midst of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, just as the Lord told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged, and lay them down there. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. For the priests bearing the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. The people passed over in haste and when all the people had finished passing over the ark of the Lord and the priests passed over before the people. The sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the people of Israel, as Moses had told them. About 40,000 ready for war passed over before the Lord for battle, to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him, just as they had stood in awe of Moses all the days of his life. Amen. Let's continue to, to worship God, shall we, as we uh, return to him in prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we, we do thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that you have blessed us, uh, that you've been with us. Lord, we, we thank you for um, all the promises that you make to us. Uh, Lord, that you are trustworthy. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are the sovereign God. And so we're able to come to you and to talk to you and to, to praise you and to give thanks to you. 
because of who you are. And we thank you, Father, that you are the same God who was with uh, Moses and Joshua and throughout the Bible, Lord, you are the same God who is with us today. And we thank you that uh, because of the, the completed, finished work of the Lord Jesus on the cross, that we can call you Father, that we can cry out to you, and that you hear our prayers. And so, Father, we do cry out to you this morning. Lord, we cry out with regard to the, the world and the mess that this world that we're in. We think of all the, uh, the, the problems and the, the deaths through the, the pandemic and all the lives that have been affected and all those who are suffering, whether they're mentally or physically or even spiritually, suffering because of it. We thank you that you are the God who hears and you are the God who heals. So, Father, we pray to each one that you will be what they need. And for those, Lord, who are, who are really so struggling and suffering because of injustices going on in this world. We think particularly of America and what's going on there. And, but, Lord, it's, it's in all the other parts of the world where we see injustice. And so, Lord, we cry out to you again to have mercy. That your will will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, that you will uh, be merciful and that through your Holy Spirit you will use these events, albeit they are bad, that you will use them for good and that through them you will uh, bring men and women and boys and girls to know the Lord Jesus as the Lord and Saviour. Father, we, we pray that for our world, but we pray that for, for our town, for our country, for our village, for our friends and our families who aren't Christians, Lord, that they may come to know the Lord Jesus and put their trust in him. So Lord, we just pray that you will, you will be with us through your Holy Spirit today, that you will um, open our eyes as we read and look into the Bible together, that you will teach us, maybe encourage us, maybe convict us. But Lord, even though we are meeting online through this medium, we just pray that we will know that we've met with you, the, the living God today, and we give you all the glory. Amen. So we continue uh, our series, as I said at the beginning, into the, the book of Joshua. And we come to chapter 4. And uh, we're going to split chapter 4 into, into two halves, in effect. So this morning, we're going to be looking at the, the first uh, 14 verses, those verses I've just read. But before I go any further, I just want you to, um, to notice something. And it, it's been a... A reoccurring theme though we've not really highlighted it but I just thought it'd be worth highlighting you see there's a pattern that emerges and actually um, it goes throughout the Bible but particularly here in in the book of Joshua and the pattern is this the pattern is that the God speaks he commands Joshua gives him an instruction if you like Joshua receives it and then in turn he does what he's commanded he, he passes that on to the people and then lo and behold, the, the people do it. And um, they're successful. And that's the pattern. God speaks to Joshua. Joshua speaks to the people. The people obey. And God's name is glorified. And we see a bit of that here in, in uh, chapter 4. And we'll, we'll come on to it in due course. But just, just keep an eye out for that pattern as, as we continue our, our look through Joshua. It must have been an amazing occasion and a, an amazing event. It's one of you like one of the most climactic um, occurrences, events in, in all biblical history, if you like. As we saw last time, the, the Israelites had, at least this generation, had, had waited 40 years for this day. Joshua and Caleb had waited longer. Back 500 years to, to Abraham had been waiting for this day. And now it had come. Now, now they were striding, if you like, across the Jordan. Opened for them by, by God in, in such a miraculous way, demonstrating his power. Behind them, well behind them they were, they were leaving the... The desert, the wilderness, they'd been there for 40 years that they'd been just meandering around. Behind them were 
the countless funerals of the, that genre of generation who had who had dined out while they'd been going around the, the the wilderness. All those who who hadn't trusted in God's promise. All those ideas, slavery in Egypt now behind them. No longer just nomadics, just wandering. Now, now a whole new future was, if you like, opening up to them as the waters opened before them. Before them lay a, a land that was just richer than their dreams, more, more fruitful than they could, they could hope for, more, more beautiful than they could imagine. This was God's promised land. And now, now it was theirs by God's steadfast promise. Oh, it, must have, it must have felt surreal to finally be standing in Canaan. I don't know, um, thinking back, you know, the first time you, you perhaps uh, bought your first house or you moved into your first house and you had the keys and perhaps up to that point you'd be just thinking about what you wanted to do, how are you going to decorate, which fireplace were you going to pull out or wherever it may be, you know, the, just the anticipation and, and the excitement. And then, and then to get the key and to open it and the door to your new house opens. Oh, and your emotions just soar, just the excitement, maybe a bit of trepidation as you realise about the work you've got to do, but oh, just, oh, just the, the fulfilment of what you've been looking forward to. For the, for the Israelites, it must have been just so much more than that. To, to be, to be the, the fulfilment of, a, of an ancient promise to Abraham before them, being part of it, must have just been overwhelming. I can, uh, can you imagine their joy, especially magnified by the, the recent events. You know, they, they turned up to the Jordan and it was in flood. There was no, there was no way they could cross the Jordan. It was, it was impossible. It was, it was impassable. There would have been things underfoot they couldn't see. They, it just would have been a, a nightmare. But as we saw last time, God, God intervened, if you like. He performed a, a miracle that was, that was parallel to the, the miracle of the Exodus from Egypt. You know, when, when God parted the Red Sea. And now he was doing the same. God... God had meant what he'd said to, to Moses all those years before. And here again, if you like, I was going to say, was his signature move. And he was here to, to assure his people that he was good to his word. Never been to, to Israel. Um, but I believe there's a lot of song and a lot of dancing. Um, because that's the sort of people they are. That's probably a sweeping statement, but you almost get that impression, don't you? But just think of the celebrations that they would have had. Think of the, the songs and, and the shouts as, as God's people worshipped him and exalted him as they crossed and as they, they were now in the promised land. But there was, but there was also one important act that, that calls for our attention this morning. After Israel crossed, God gave Joshua some really specific instructions. And remember at the beginning, God gives instructions to Joshua. Joshua passes it on to the people and the people obey. And God gave some very specific instructions that we see in verses 1 to 3. Um, after that, the, the entire nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua and he said this, Choose twelve men from the people. One man from each tribe, command them, take twelve stones from this place in the middle of the Jordan where the free priests' feet are standing, carry them with you, set them down at the place where you spend the night. And Joshua did exactly what, what he was told. He, he selected twelve men, one, one from each tribe, and he sent those men uh, into the riverbed, into the Jordan where the where the priests were, and they were to bring back these 12 stones. These stones that, are, that at one point would have been um, unseen, untouchable, covered by water. They would have been, if you like, a challenge to the faith of God's people. 
But now these stones were divinely accessible. And we read that the, the 12 men, they, they hoisted heavy stones on their shoulders. These weren't little pebbles, these were big things, as, as heavy as they could manage. And they carried them from the Jordan's floor and they, they took them into the promised land to Gilgal and, and they laid them there. The Bible says they, they just put them there and then Joshua came and, and set them up. But they obeyed God's command. And they were stacked as a sign, uh, an unmistakable marker, if you are, at the very place where God had demonstrated his, his power to overcome any obstacle to his will. And these stones, they weren't naturally put where they were. They were put there for a purpose, the Bible says. They were put in such a way that that Israel's children, the Bible says, would come along and, and spot them, realise they were different, and ask the question, what are they for? What are, what are these stones? And they would ask for an explanation, and, and here, the answer God wants the generation to know. He says, tell them the story. Tell them the story of how the waters of the Jordan were, were cut off from in front of the Ark of the Covenant. When it crossed the Jordan, the, the waters were cut off. Oh, these stones, oh, they had a very particular purpose. They were to, to remind and, and they were to teach the nation, the whole nation, generation after generation after generation. What were they to teach? Well, they were, they were concerning the, the marvellous things, the marvellous deeds that God had done. Oh, wow, a, a teaching aid and memorial. Notice that God commanded Joshua that a man, a representative of the twelve tribes should be chosen. You see, all God's people are included here. Not just the ones who were going to live on this side of the river, but all of God's people were included in the miracle. And in the, the collecting of the stones, and they were all called to remember. But this is, this is not the first time that God has done this. It's not the first time he, he'd asked his people to remember. After his, his mighty work in, in rescuing the people from, from Egypt, and remember the Passover? God says... When your children ask you what this means, tell them. Same, isn't it? When the children see something that you're doing or, or something triggers them to ask, tell them, tell them this, God says. And you find this, this call to, to remembrance in lots of places. Deuteronomy, Ecclesiastes, here in Joshua. And the word doesn't, just mean just to remember it means to focus on to to reflect on with with love and, and devotion so much more than just remembering isn't it that this theme is is picked up in the new testament um, as paul says to, to timothy remember jesus christ now you might think Timothy, how could Timothy forget the Lord Jesus? But Paul says, remember the Lord Jesus. Peter says, it's right to refresh your memory. Yeah, it's the same thing. Remember, remember. And of course, the, the Lord Jesus himself on the, the night he was betrayed, we, we read that he broke bread and he gave it to the disciples and he said, what? Do this in remembrance of me. So important, isn't it, to to remember. If you've ever had children around, perhaps if you've had some of your own or, or grandchildren or you've worked in school or wherever it may be, you come to hear the, the what, why questions a lot, don't you? What's that for? Why is that so big? Why is that so small? Why does it rain? Why are you so old, Daddy? Get that a lot. Why are you so grey? What are you doing? Usually followed by why. It's there all the time, isn't it? I can imagine um, with all uh, the homeschooling that's going on with the pandemic that 
Parents must be getting really fed up of those what, why questions and can't wait for the schools to reopen. They can get really tiring, tough to explain the answers. I always knew when I'd asked it too many times at home, um, I'd get that look from my mum that's like, right, that's enough now. You have to stop. You've asked enough. But this is exactly what, what God is setting up here with these stones. Their, their job is to trigger this, this what, why type of question. Verse 6, what do these stones mean to you? That's the question that will be asked. What do these stones mean? Well, God gives them the answer to the question. It's great, isn't it? Um, God supplies everything that we need. He, he tells them what the question is going to be, then he tells them the answer, and next time we'll see in more detail the why. But God gives them the answer in verse 7 to Joshua. It says, Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. At this moment, they were told to, to reach into the Jordan River where the priests were standing and to pull out the stones. And as I said, these 12 stones were representing the, the 12 tribes. These, these 12 stones were, were representing, if you like, a, a rite of passage from, from what they'd been to now to where they've been promised. These, these 12 stones represented the, the divine, if you like, the, the sacred. They were to, to represent a, a transition from, from wandering to a position of stability, a land. These 12 stones were a memorial to God, not, not a memorial to man. They were, they were stones of evidence. Something happened at this spot. And again, at this place, well, God was here. God was here and God did something amazing. And really that's it, isn't it? It's, it's all about God. It's all about God. Seeing that, that rock pile and, and hearing the story, the people of Israel would know clearly that it had not been they who crossed the Jordan of their own account. It was impossible. But I suppose the generations have come might have thought it was possible. But, but no, the stones are here to tell you otherwise. And these, these stones cry out, God did this. It was by his hand we have crossed the river, we forded the river. By, by his power and his faithfulness, we've accomplished this. It's all about God. And Joshua, Joshua describes the answer in detail that should be given. And as I thought about that, it's, it's so different, isn't it, to the world in which we live today. You know, in our culture, you know, we, we, we pick and choose what questions we want to ask. We pick and choose the answers that we like of whether we take any notice or not. And in our fallenness, we want to dictate the questions and the answers that please us. But God's word in some ways presses us, doesn't it? God's word tells us the important questions. And further to the, the question, what does it mean? It's not whatever you want it to mean. Like so many of the questions and answers today. While that's the postmodern context, it's not the biblical answer. And it isn't the answer we're given in God's word. These stones mean something. And if we're Christians with a, a biblical worldview, one that, one, one that begins with God in his holy majesty, with power in creation, we recognise that, that, that when God intervenes in his world, he does so purposefully. So Joshua says, 
The answer to the question is God. God dried up the Jordan before you. In the same way that he dried up the Red Sea 40 years earlier and rescued you then. It's all about God. So the, the people of God are to tell their children and their children's children what God had done. And the uniqueness of what God had done. You see, it was a, it was a permanent sign to the people. The Bible says, in God's instruction passed to Joshua, that it was for generations to come. It wasn't a, a short-term thing. It was to be there like the Passover is today. The same questions are asked, and this was going to be what these stones were for. Now, the Bible doesn't give us really any detail, but it may well have been these very stones that, that John the Baptist pointed at when he was baptising in Matthew 3, 9. It was in Beth, Bethabara that he was baptising, and this, this was the supposed spot of the, the crossing of the Jordan, the very passage of God's children, the Israelites. Could have been. But regardless, it was to be a memorial, a reminder for generations to come. And just as, just as God wanted the stones as a memorial of his great name, we're living this side of the cross. And we need to, to look at the, the empty cross and the empty tomb in any situation allowing us to say, since God raised the Lord Jesus from the dead, will he not also raise me? It's a memorial. It's a, a way of remembering. Look at the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Just as the people were to look at those stones and remember God and what God had done. As Christians we're to, we're to look at the cross, the empty tomb, and remember what the Lord Jesus has done. The unique and, and dramatic intervention of God in redemptive history. They're there to, to focus our, our vision so that right here, right now, we can be strengthened by his presence and his power. So that we can say to our children and our grandchildren, our God did this for us. That was the story, that was the, the account that the Israelites were told about the stones. But we can say that about the cross. Our God did this for us. He is the faithful one. He's the one who makes promises and fulfills them. And his promise is for you and for future generations. And it, why? Because he is the living God. We have to remember. We have to remember. And then the verses 10 to 14. We just see... God's people obeying. And it's wonderful, it's marvellous. We read lots of the Old Testament and probably, and it is true to us today, we, we don't always obey God, do we? God tells us something and we'll perhaps hear, but we don't necessarily do it. Well, well, here we have God's people obeying God. And we see that the value of instructions is not just in, in hearing, not just in knowing them, it's in doing them. It's one way, it's one thing to, to know the way, to know the path. But it's another to, to walk in it, isn't it? And we read that the priests remained standing. There in verse 10, they were in the middle of the Jordan and they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant in. And God's presence is there both providing the, the dry path for them but also protecting the way for them. Through it all, the, the ark was still. Almost, almost watching over there, the people as they're crossing before it. Ensuring their safety. And the time it was there, well, that was dictated by the slowest member of the people of Israel as they crossed, went across. God makes his very present help the same length 
as our necessities, doesn't he? He doesn't say, I've done enough. I know you're still struggling, but you've done enough, I'm off. No, he's there with us all the way. Not till the, the last straggler had crossed to the further shore does he, does he stop and the water starts flowing. I don't know whether he picked it up, but at the end of verse 10 is that little phrase, the, the people hurried over. And I wondered about that phrase. I wonder why they hurried. It could have been a fear thing. Oh, I don't know how long is this going to last. But I don't think it was a fear thing. I don't think it was. I think rather it was a, an eager desire to, to get to the promised land, to set their feet on the promise that God had made. It could have been that they saw the, the, the priests there holding this, uh, the ark. So perhaps they thought that the quicker they are, then it would save the priests' arms a bit and they could come over too. But regardless, they hurried across, eager to, to embrace the fulfilment of God's promise. But also we read in verses 12 and 13, more um, people obeying God. Remember, remember these two and a half tribes, they'd already settled on the, the other side of the Jordan. Um, and how they'd had that argument, not argument, a discussion with Moses about, well, he wasn't happy, but they, they promised that when the people crossed, that they would cross, their armed men would cross in front of God's people and they would fight. And we have the fulfilment of that. They, they come to, to Joshua and Joshua holds them to it earlier on in Josh, the book of Joshua. And here we have the fulfilment, if you like, of their promise, their their obedience it says this, the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the people of Israel, as Moses had told them. About 40,000 ready for war passed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. They were fulfilling their part of the bargain. They were fulfilling their promise that their armed men would go across. That must have been a sight, wasn't it? See these stormtroopers, 40,000 of them fully armed, leading the way. And in verse 14, we see the, the chain of command is complete. We see Joshua's leadership is confirmed mightily by God. Remember... God spoke to Joshua who spoke to the people and the people obeyed. And now the people had seen that it really was Joshua's God's man. God really was speaking through Joshua. Now there is only one God appointed leader for God's people. Remembering him, communicating the truth about him and walking in his ways. That's our calling as God's people today. And we have stones, don't we? We have memorials. Every time you, you pass a church building, it's a memorial to God's goodness. There's nothing sadder, is it, than seeing a, a church closed. Oh, but a church that is alive, that's a memorial to God's goodness. That's a, a reminder of his promises. And as Christians, we, we are memorials, aren't we? We're to um, remind ourselves, but also others, of God's goodness. So when people ask us for the hope that we have, we're to tell them about the Lord Jesus. We're to give them the answers. We're to point people to the Lord Jesus. These stones that we read about in Joshua, they're not to point to Joshua. They're not to point to God's people. They're to point to God. And what God had promised and what God had fulfilled. We're no different today. So look back on your life. Remember what God has done for you. Rejoice in the fact of what God has done for you. Thank him and glorify him for what he's done for you. Tell others what he's done for you. Be, be a living memorial 
to the living God. Amen. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for um, your word. We thank you for the Bible. We thank you for the book of Joshua. Lord, we thank you for the, the way that we see your promises, that even they're being fulfilled. And we thank you that you are still keeping your promise even today. And Father, we just pray that you will help us to remember. Help us to remember your goodness to us. Help us to remember that all that you've done for us in the Lord Jesus. Father, we just thank you that you are our Heavenly Father and that you love us. Help us to be living memorials for your glory, we pray. Amen. If you'd like to get in touch, we'd love to hear from you. Um, you can do it through the YouTube, through a, a, a comment. Maybe you could subscribe and pick up the, the previous uh, talks if you haven't already. Or you can go to Instagram or Facebook or or you can get in touch with, uh, with us through our website, BethelBaptistLive.co.uk. It'd be great to hear from you. Uh, we look forward to, to you being in touch and to seeing you soon, God willing. Take care. God bless.